This is the day the Lord has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. We're going to be glad and rejoice because we have a choice. The choice. Everyone turn to your neighbor and say, you got a choice. The choice. That's why you're called chosen, because you're making the right choice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. <laughs> what a day and time we are in. My gosh. Exposure, exposure, exposure. All kinds of things going on. I love it. <laughs> Again, I want to reiterate the arena that you and I are alive at this time in a generation for the return of the Lord. I mean, can we even comprehend it? We get so caught up in our busy lives sometimes that we lose sight that we are the generation of the Lord's return. Amen. Let's let that penetrate a little bit. Everyone say, I am the generation of the Lord's return. This is called reality. We are the generation of his return. This generation will not pass away until he returns. He's going to return in this generation. There's no doubt about it. There's no ifs or assumptions. He is coming in this generation. So there must be a preparation. He's trying to get his children out of the nest of comfort. He's trying to get them in position. He's not looking at what we've done. He's looking at what you're becoming. Amen? Amen. Everybody here has made mistakes. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. We've all blown it. There isn't anyone here that's perfect, but in him we're perfect. Thank God. Amen. Would you turn to Romans chapter 8? Romans 8. Glory. <clears throat> Did you get touched this morning? <laughs> it's an overflow from Friday night. Praise God. Romans 8. I used to be Roman. I was Roman all over the earth for the truth. <laughs> I was a Roman Catholic looking for the truth. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> In Romans 8, verse 1, let's speak it together. There is therefore what? Now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the Spirit. Again, there's condemnation to those who walk in the flesh. Amen. In other words, if you're a Christian and you're walking according to the flesh, there is condemnation. But if you're walking according to the Spirit, there is no condemnation. It's real simple. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh and account of the sin, he condemned sin in his flesh. That the righteous requirement, everyone say righteous requirement, of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the what? But according to the spirit. A righteous requirement is meant by, it's meeting a condition. Everyone say, I must meet a condition. That's what a requirement is. You are meeting a condition. Amen? In this condition, when you meet the condition that God has required, it puts you in position. Oh, I better say that again. So by meeting the condition, it puts you in a position. So God has certain requirements no matter what you're doing. He's always got conditions for me and you no matter what it is. Why? To put us in the position for victory. To express him. 
so that there are no failures. In verse 5, now again, the righteous requirement is met by meeting a condition which puts a person in position. That's too many people live in a false position, not knowing that they are an offense to God. I'm going to say that again. Many live in a false position, not knowing that they are an offense to God. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh do what? Set their minds on the flesh. Is anybody speaking this with me in here? Praise God. Verse 5. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit, to be carnally minded, fleshly minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind, the natural mind, is enmity against God for it is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can it be. So then those who live in the flesh or in the carnal world cannot please God. That's why he says come out from among them. Again, many live in a false position not knowing they are an offense to God. That's why he's called the rock of offense. The what? The rock of offense in James chapter 1. Rock of offense. That's today's title. In verse 12. James chapter 1 and verse 12. Is everybody there? Blessed is the man who endures temptation. In other words, blessed is the man who overcomes. So the one that doesn't overcome is what? Cursed. Cursed. For when he has been approved, everyone say approved. approved. Those are conditions, aren't they? <laughs> Those are conditions that have been met. Amen? No, so when God brings us conditions to be, made, to be met, it is to enter a position of approval. Blessed is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Powerful. Let no one say when he is tempted, I'm tempted by God, for God, not, God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth what? Yeah. Brings forth what? death. Again, blessed are the overcomers because they meet the conditions to enter a position of approval. God warns us of the desires of offense. These are desires that offend him. He warns us of the desires of offense and wants us to be, wants these things to be removed from us. And what these, when we fall into these desires that are offensive to him, it removes us from out of the position and brings us to in an area where we lose his trust and then eventually there's separation and eventually death. Everybody okay? Again, a, a righteous requirement is met by meeting a condition. By meeting the condition, it puts us in a position. Amen? Amen? One of the things that God warns us about is certain desires that are offensive to him that will move us out of position. That's all you need to do is agree with it. He is calling his children out of darkness and into the light. He's requiring more of us, more commitment. More sanctification. More. In Isaiah chapter 8. Rock of offense. 
Isaiah chapter 8. In verse 11, rock of offense. You know, the Lord showed me this morning while he was giving me this message how many he was grieved in the spirit caused me to grieve. Did you ever find yourself saying things to the Lord, I'm sorry, but it wasn't because of something you did, but because of what's going on? That, because that's relationship. Lord, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry these things are happening. I'm so sorry. And I saw many people falling, and there were even ones he showed me. And he said, because their lives are, are not in both of his hands. Their lives are only in one part of his hand. And he said, what's coming is many will fall. They will be caused to fall into both of his hands. That's what's coming. This is where we're at right now. You know, one of the things a few weeks ago or whatever, I don't know, but anyways, we talked about the, the earlier latter rain since September 23rd, that new birth. It was a, a season of the Messiah because there's a big expectation of the return of the Lord now than there ever has been. And we are entering the early and latter rain, which means double portion. So that means double portion of exposure, double portion of judgment, double portion of blessing, double portion of the anointing. Everything is there. So he's requiring me and you to meet these conditions to get in position. In Isaiah 8 and verse 11, let's speak it please. For the Lord spoke thus to me with a strong hand. Everyone say strong hand. And instructed me that I should not walk in the way of this people, saying, do not say a conspiracy concerning all that this people call a conspiracy, nor be afraid of their threats, nor be troubled. The Lord of hosts, him you shall hollow. Let him be your fear. Let him be your dread. And he will be a what? sanctuary but a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both the house of Israel as a trap and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem you know when he speaks of Israel and Jerusalem he speaks of us too and, and many among them shall stumble they shall fall and be what broken be snared and what taken remember a sanctuary is a place of worship it's a place where God's word is at. It's release. A stone of stumbling means small. And the rock of offense means big. The fall. He says they will fall, right? They're going to what? Fall. The fall. Broken. Snared. They will be taken. There's a result of three areas of fall. I want to talk. Simply just mention these things. There's three areas of the fall where they will what? They'll be eventually the end result will be taken if they allow this fall. The first fall is the fall of self-reliance. Self-reliance, the fall to self-reliance. Let's live a, a life according to the world, the world's standards. The, the next fall, there's three areas of fall. The fall to worldly desires. Materialism. Lusts. And the third fall is actually a fear. It's a fall to fear of the loss of the world. Many fear losing the things of the world. So the first fall is the self-reliance. The second fall is the fall of worldly desires. And the third fall is the loss of the world. It's fear. All of it is lust and sin. 
And it's brought upon a lack of consistency. All of it is lust and sin and is brought upon, upon, for, upon a lack of consistency which results in compromise, complacency, and laziness in the spirit. I'm going to say this again because I think it's vitally important. He says a stone of stumbling. There's reason, there'll be a fall. There'll be the, those, the fall will be, they'll be broken. They'll be snared and they'll be taken. The result is three areas of the fall. The fall to self-reliance. The fall to worldly desires and the fall to the fear of losing the loss of the world. All of it is sin and and lust, and it's brought upon by a lack of consistency, which results in compromise, complacency, and laziness in the spirit. Hallelujah. Let's go a little further. In verse 15, Isaiah 8, verse 15. Is everybody there? And, and many among them shall what? Stumble. And they shall fall and be broken. Be snared and taken. Bind up the testimony. Seal the long among my disciples. And I will wait on the Lord. Who hides his face from the house of Jacob. I will hope in him. Here am I and the children whom the Lord has given me. We are for what? Signs and wonders in Israel. From the Lord of hosts who dwells in Mount Zion. And when, you, and when they say to you, seek those who are mediums and wizards, who whisper and mutter, shall not a people seek their God? Should they seek the dead on behalf of the living? <clears throat> to the law and the testimony, if they do not speak according to this word, if they do not speak according to his word, it is because there is no light in them. They will pass through it hard-pressed and hungry. And it shall happen when they are hungry that they will be enraged and curse their king and their God and look upward. Then they will look to the earth for help and see trouble and darkness, gloom and anguish. And they will be driven into what? Darkness. Why? Because they were not in position. They, were, they resisted the conditions to be met the requirement, and chose to live their own way instead of God's way. We are to be um, a sign and wonder because living, uh, uh, though, though many will be a loss of sign and wonder, but you and I are to be living according to the, God's word and as a sign and wonder. Many will fall out of position because of living according to the word, I mean the world, with priorities that don't please God. Has everybody got it? These priorities are what? Don't please God. So if your priorities are pleasing God, are you going to be in position? Yes, you'd hope so anyways. They're not living according to his word and losing the light that, are, that was first brought upon them. Looking to the world for help will be, be, have them draw into darkness unless they turn and repent. You know, one of the things that people lose sight of... Jesus did not come and say, love, love, love. He came and said, repent, repent, repent. Mo you know, right? Does everybody get it? John the Baptist did not come and say, love, love, love. In fact, he was pretty rough. He came and said, repent, repent, repent. He loved us so much that he kept saying, repent, to turn away. Turn away from what? What was going to separate us from him eternally? He is the rock of offense. <laughs> Listen, if you're not living a life, you and I should be in a place where we are an offense to the world. If you're not an offense to the world, then you're an offense to God. It's real simple. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> Romans 5. Yeah.
Yeah, that's exactly how I feel. <laughs> Romans 5. Oh, glory. <laughs> it's already there in verse 14. Romans 5, verse 14. Again, we are seeing conditions being met prophetically all over the world. These conditions that are being met are where Jesus is going to return in a position. <laughs> but again, he's going to first come through the body of Christ before he personally returns. In Romans 5, in verse 14, Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is the type of Jesus who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God or the plan of God, and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. In other words, Jesus came with the plan. It's amazing how much grace is being preached and how much love of God is being preached. When, true, when it's really the reality of true grace is not God's unmerited favor. Does everybody get it? It's his unmerited love. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Favor is earned. In verse 16, And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned, for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses resulted in justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as through one man's offense, judgment came to all men, resulting in condemnation, even so through the one man's righteous act. The free gift came to all men, resulting in justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners, so also by one man's obedience, many will be made righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abound, grace abound much more. So that as sin reigned in death, even so grace that might reign through the righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Again, I want to remind you that grace is the plan of escape. That's why he came in the fullness of grace. Amen? And truth. It is the plan of escape. That means you must cooperate. Cooperation. Without cooperation, you can't, if you're not cooperating with the plan of escape, you don't escape. It's that simple. <laughs> the key to life, eternal life, is righteousness. There must be a pr production of a fruit of righteousness. Now, the key to righteousness is obedience. The key to obedience is consistency. Again, I'll say this again, the key to eternal life, the key to God's life is righteousness. The key to righteousness is obedience. The key to obedience is consistency. Too many people quit. They give up so easy. I didn't give up on the drug dealer, though. I stood and sought the dope out and whatever I needed to do to get high, not realizing it was his presence. But once I met the most high, I didn't need to get high no more because I got high all the time. Now I'm an addict to his presence, and I love it. <laughs> the plan of God, again, is called grace and cooperation to his plan and word produces righteousness. Amen? Matthew 16. Oh, hallelujah. 
glory. Matthew 16, 13. When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, Some, John the Baptist, some Elijah, others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Then Jesus looked to them face to face, said, Okay, now, let's get reality here. Who do you say I am? And I'm going to tell you, not all of them jumped up. <laughs> One did. Simon Peter answered and said, You are the Christ. You are the eternal presence, power, and truth of God Almighty. The Son of God. The living God. And Jesus answered and said, and Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter. And on this rock, the anointing, I will build my church. I will build my body. He didn't say he was going to put a pope in position. Peter's not a pope on the rope. Hallelujah. Jesus meant the rock, the anointing. This is a foundation. And I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the what? Keys. Keys. Hmm. Let me tell you, when Jesus gives you a key, it's an important matter. <laughs> and I will give you the keys... Of the kingdom. Woo! See, we all carry keys to the kingdom. Can you imagine that? You carry a keys to the eternal kingdom. Uh, the eternal, uh, and, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, heaven being the unseen realm. So I'm going to give you a keys to access the unseen realm. This is what this is all about. And I'm going to give you authority to use these keys to combat demonic forces, demons, and ungodly desires. Anything that will try to get you out of position so that you can meet every condition to keep you in position. And I will give you the what? Keys of the kingdom of heaven. In verse 20, then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time, Jesus began to show to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and the scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. Now, you got to remember that Peter is the one that got the revelation, right? Man, you're the Christ. Got it. You're him. You're the anointed one in his anointing, the eternal power, presence, and truth of God Almighty, the living God. And Peter's like, yeah, I got that revelation. I know who you are. Now, say what? You got to die? No way. I can't allow that to happen. I can't allow that to happen. I love you too much. I'll fight for you. I'll die for you. Well, then Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine taking God aside and saying, listen, I know something better. You can't do this. You know how many people do that by saying no to God? Amen. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. I can't allow this to happen to you. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. Why was he an offense to him? Here it is. For you, not, you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of the world or the things of men. That was offensive to God. And it should be offensive to you. 
Then he goes on to say, he goes, okay, let's go bring this a little bit deeper. Verse 24, if anyone desires to come after me, he says, let him deny himself. Quit, come out of self-reliance. And take up your cross and fight. Fight for my presence. And fight against the desires of the world that will try to nullify the conditions that are, you and I must meet. And then you can follow me out of this world. Amen? Then you can what? Follow me out of this world. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will what? Find it. Jesus challenges their faith and belief and the connection with himself. Then he releases a reality of identity and authority. He tells them also the understanding and the quest of his mission to fulfill. But the enemy influenced Peter to interrupt the mission Jesus was called to fulfill. And he will attempt to interrupt your mission. People's missions have been interrupted with addiction. They've been interrupted with fornication and lust, greediness, all kinds of things. Anything that interrupts your fellowship with Christ and his house is of the devil. We should live a life that is revolved around his presence, his word, and his sanctuary. Everybody got it? We should live a life that is revolved around his presence, his word, and his sanctuary. Or we are not able to meet the conditions to enter the position. And that position is unconditional surrender. It's unconditional surrender, not survival. It's unconditional surrender in everything. You are surrendered to Him. In other words, your life must revolve around his presence, his word, and his sanctuary. That's what our life is, should it revolve around. Your life does not revolve around your job, your family, or your friends. Your life revolves around, has everybody got it? His presence, his word, and his house. Everything else falls into place. It's amazing to me in how many people make their decisions on everything else but those three. And they wonder why they're not meeting the conditions for position and constantly missing the blessing. Or it's constantly being stolen. Or they're stagnant and not growing. He says, deny yourself, right? Self-reliance, pick up the cross, fight with the sword of the Spirit to resist the lust of the world, and then you're able to follow. To follow, you're following in His presence, you know, and, and in His presence is perfect love, which casts out all fear. Many settle for good, not willing to fight for the best. They, they settle for good or not willing to wait for the best. They're still... In a false position. Living out of their carnal mind instead of the spirit. In 1 Peter chapter 2. There would be more advancement in the kingdom if people began to live their lives and live it around, revolved around God's presence, His word, and sanctuary. Things would be totally different. That's why people drift, 
That's why people fall. That's why people are offended. Again, you and I should be an offense to the world. If you're not an offense to the world, you're an offense to God. 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 1. Therefore, laying aside all malice, all deceit, hypocrisy, and envy, and all evil speaking as newborn babes, desire the pure milk of the word that you may grow thereby. If indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious, coming to him as a living what? Stone. Rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. Everyone say, I'm precious. You also, as living stones, are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. Therefore, it is also contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious, but those who are disobedient, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and the rock of what? Offense. They stumble being disobedient to the word to which they were also appointed. Everyone say, I'm appointed, appointed. to live out of the word. He said, but you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but now a people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Beloved, I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul having your conduct honorable among the Gentiles, that when they speak against you as evildoers, which they will because you're an offense to them, they may by your good works, which they observe, glorify God in the day of visitation. Does everybody understand this? <laughs> Being disobedient to the word will move a position, person out of that position. You and I are chosen by God and precious to proclaim praises. <laughs> Listen, many want to serve to be seen and not willing to serve to the king. It's not about being seen. Your greatest service is behind closed doors. Amen. Where many people only want to do things for the kingdom according to their own convenience. That's why he says be ready in season and out of season. Listen, we're either earning the trust or losing the trust. People that lose the trust have to go back and beg again Amen. to get things done. In Acts chapter 4. Rock of offense. Pride and arrogance. It's a very big stumbling block to people. And the only reason why pride and arrogance is there is because they're still in self-reliance. Is anybody not warm in here? Good. I just want to make sure everybody's not warm. <laughs> you should be hot inside, though. You should be on fire. There should be burning like crazy in there. <laughs> Acts 4, verse 13. Let's speak it. Now, when they saw the what? Boldness. Everyone say boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with who? Jesus. That's what made them trained and educated. <laughs> 
And seeing the man who had been healed standing with them, they said nothing against it. They could say nothing against it. But when they had commanded them to go aside, go aside out of the council, they conferred among themselves, saying, What shall we do to these dudes? For indeed, that no table miracle has been done through them is evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem, and we cannot deny it. But so that it spreads no further among the people, let us severely threaten them that from now on they speak to no man in, this na in, the, in the name of Jesus. So they called them in, they called Peter and John in, and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered and said to them, Well, it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than God you judge. <laughs> For we cannot but speak the things which we have seen and heard. So when they had further threatened them, they let them go, finding no way of punishing them because of the people, since they all glorified God for what had been done. For the man was over 40 years old on whom this miracle of healing had been performed. And being let go, they went to their own companions and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. In other words, they weren't about men pleasers, they were about God pleasers. Amen? They had the boldness and witness. They didn't care. Why? They were an offense to them, weren't they? Well, you and I should be an offense to this world because we stand for what is truth. We don't laugh at the dirty jokes. We don't, we don't cooperate with the world. We don't, we don't live according to the world's ways of lust, the ways, the integrities of the world, the way they work. As long as they can get away with it, they do it. Amen? We live a higher standard because the Lord is always before us. We are in relationship with him. It's different. Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrew. Praise God. Some of you are going to go home and brew quickly. <laughs> so you can get warmed up. <laughs> Hebrew. Verse 5 and 6. Hebrews 11. Verse 5 and 6. scriptures will be all right. No, I'll be kidding. <laughs> hey, look, God's stretching you. You know, when you stretch something, you can put more in it. Amen? Amen? Amen. <laughs> Verse 5 and 6, By faith Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death. And was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Wow. Now I want you to understand. So those that are not pleasing God, do you think they're going to be taken? Heck no. Let that be a part of that day that's getting closer and closer. And that rapture comes. If you ain't a pleaser of God, you ain't being taken. Verse 6, but without faith it is impossible to please him, for he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a what? Rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Again, until we begin to live a life around his presence, his word in the sanctuary, that he rewards you. Man, when you go for a job, you let the job know. Listen, dear, this is how it is. I'm a servant of the Most High God. I need these days off. Boom, boom, boom. This is how it is. Why? Because I'm a servant. I serve God, not you. God is my source and my provider, not my job. He blesses me with the job. But if it interferes with anything else, then it's not of God. And eventually, it's going to crumble. Is everybody okay? Praise God. He is a rewarder of those who seek him. Same thing in anything that you and I do, purchases, whatever, even travel. 
Be careful. Make sure it's of God. Because the enemy's always trying to set you up and snare. Whatever you do. Second Peter chapter 1. Now, don't get me wrong. We're not religious about this. Amen? Amen. You know, doctors and nurses and people that are sometimes on call, they can't, you know, fellowship in certain areas. All glory. But, you know, we want to be pleasers of God. So we put things in priority. If you're not living a priority, prior, prior, that's how you say it prioritized life, amen, then it can't be pleasing to God. Second Peter 1, is everybody there? Verse 2, let's speak it. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, as His divine power is given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us by glory and virtue by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through what? Through lust. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add your faith to virtue, your virtue to knowledge, knowledge to self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to the blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent, more diligent, more consistent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. For an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Partaker of his divine nature. Why? Because being positioned. Remember, we are meeting conditions to get us in position. And in that position, you'll be a pleaser of God and not a displeaser of God. You'll be an offense to the world. Amen. Amen. And God will be your, your defense. <laughs> Second Corinthians chapter 5, and we'll close here. Now, it doesn't mean you go out and cause offenses to the world. Amen? You don't go out and slap people across the head with the Bible and stuff like that. You know? They're an offense to the world because they can't stand the presence of God that's on you. You're an offense to the world because you don't agree with the way the world sees things. Again, if you're not an offense to the world, you're an offense to God. Verse 16, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16. Therefore, from now on, we recognize no one according to the flesh. That's simple. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer because he doesn't look like that no more. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. All things have passed away, and behold, all things are becoming new. That's getting positioned, isn't it? In other words, things are not... Old things will not pass away unless you meet the conditions for position. That means cooperation. 
Now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has been given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not imputing the trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be what? Reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Again, if you're not an offense to the world, you're an offense to God. The rock of offense. Father, we thank you for your word. We are honored and blessed. I pray this word will be imparted to each and every one and grow and bear fruit for your glory. That would turn the hearts and set them towards you. Lord, that it would be a sign and wonder to this world for time is running out. I ask, Lord, in the name of Jesus, that everyone in this room that is sick and ill be made whole completely because your word does not return void. And you sent your word to heal our diseases and release us from the bondages and sicknesses and entanglements and affairs of this world. So according to your word here, Lord, as the rock of offense, let us be not offensive to you, but offensive to the world as a sign and wonder in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen.